1990 when I went to a wonderful talk that, um, given by Darvis the Bell in Oxford. What's not to love about a story with heroism, skullduggery, treachery, high stakes, sailors lost at sea, and life-changing sums of money? But something else also caught my imagination, and that was a succession of absolutely beautiful, stunning timepieces made by Harrison, not just ahead of their time, no pun intended, um, mechanically, but also incredibly beautiful. But why I'm really excited about this talk today is Rebecca is going to challenge many of these ideas, these thoughts that many of us come into this room with. She's going to put a completely different perspective to it. And as academics, that's what we really love, is the challenging of ideas. So this is something really exciting that I'm just really looking forward to. So um, Dr. Rebecca Higgett is a historian of science at the University of Kent, and she specializes in the relationship between science and the public in the 19th and 18th century Britain. She did her um, uh, undergraduate and master's at Durham and her PhD at Imperial and um, then went up to Edinburgh to do some postdoctoral research. Um, her research and publications have focused broadly on the relationship between um, science and the public, um, but she's been looking at particular the depiction of men in science, in biography, material culture, and the display of science in museums, the relationship between science and government. And so, of course, this is a perfect um, topic for her. Um, but she's also looked at how science has been communicated to the public in the past. So it's now lovely having her communicating science to us all in the present. So I, it gives me such great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming um, all the way for us, Rebecca. Dr. Rebecca Higgins, thank you. years ago, um, I was a curator at the National Maritime Museum in the Royal Observatory in Greenwich for five years, um, during which time um, I um, helped curate an exhibition on Longitude, which is now closed, it's now touring to the US, um, later will be in Australia, so if anyone's travelling you might still get a chance to catch it. Um, but a lot of the images, um, you'll see the reference number down there for this one, a lot of the images up here are from the collections um, of the National Maritime Museum and were things that were used in the exhibition or in the publication that went along with it. Um, that I shall be plugging more later. Um, so, longitude band. Um, here, if you can see it um, in this rather lovely watercolour, um, there are some um, typical scenes of what life um, on a ship might have been like in 1820 when this was um, drawn by Noel, uh, sorry, Thomas Stretfield. Um, the people on board the ship there um, are observing the sky. You can just about be able to see the use of octants um, and sextants there. Optical instruments. I gather this is the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technology. Um, that's about as much as I'm going to get in here. Um, otherwise, we'll be thinking about astronomy and timekeeping more. Um, but these instruments were a vital part of the story as well. Um, so they are using um, these instruments to help with navigation. Uh, we don't quite know what they're doing here. They might be um, taking observations to work out their latitude. Um, or possibly they're using them to get a reading of local time. Um, the time exactly where they are at that time, so that they can then compare that with the reference time and establish their longitude. But either way, they're managing to navigate um, probably fairly successfully, fairly accurately with the use um, of these technologies, which are still new in 1820 um, for people to be using, ordinary mariners to be using at sea, um, provided they've got access to these instruments, to the techniques, the training, the skills, um, longitude has been found. So this story is really about how you kind of get to this point, um, and I'll be talking about part of that story. Um, some of the skullduggery and sailors um, getting lost at sea will be brought into it. It's not my natural bent as an academic um, historian. I do tend to challenge um, kind of heroic, genius um, kinds of narratives. Um, but nevertheless, there is some good stuff in this story, um, and I'll try and bring some of that out today, as well as bringing some of the more kind of myth-busting um, type of stuff. So, um, I'm framing this around the fact that there is um, an anniversary this year. There was an anniversary last year, which is why we had the exhibition, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But there is also an anniversary this year, um, in particular of what has been called um, by Derek Howes and his um, work a momentous meeting um, from um, the 9th of February 1765, a meeting of the commissioners of longitude, 
This image shows um, the Admiralty, the boardroom at the Admiralty, and that's probably where they met. We know they certainly met at the Admiralty, um, although this image again is a little bit later um, and perhaps shows the Board of Admiralty itself rather than the commissioners of longitude. But at this meeting, um, the commissioners had to um, decide on the results of a trial of new longitude technologies, um, and they had to decide what to do as an outcome of that trial. By the end of the meeting, uh, they had decided to recommend to government that they dispense what is the equivalent today to billions um, of pounds worth um, of money. That is hundreds, and I mean hundreds, like 800 years worth of craftsmen's wages um, was up for grabs. So it's difficult to get a sense, um, in some ways, of how much this money was. Um, the figures don't sound so impressive to us today, but when you put them in the context of the 18th century, they are genuinely life-changing amounts of money that are being discussed. So they were talking about rewards for people then and there. They were talking about rewards that might be offered to people in the future for helping find longitude. And they were also trying to get governments to commit to an ongoing standing expense, um, which in the world of science, this is a fairly new um, idea at the time. So these recommendations were largely um, agreed to by Parliament, and they passed an act um, on the 10th of May, 1765. So the period exactly 125 years ago today, between these two dates, um, was a period of lobbying, of making sure this stuff got through Parliament. Um, I would say that this period marks a very, very significant moment in the whole of the 18th century search for longitude at sea. Um, we've seen from that picture I showed at the beginning from 1820 that it is quite a long time before the technologies start finding their way into general practice for everybody. Um, it's also a story that has a long prehistory as well. But I'm going to try and talk about um, this 250 years ago moment as a crux, a turning point really, at least in the British side of the story. And this is a very British talk I'm giving you today. Um, there are other stories to be told, particularly in France, um, which perhaps in questions we can talk about more. So who was there? Not these chaps, um, but these people. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to read um, exactly who was there, but these are the positions that the people had who were there at that meeting um, in 1765. Um, and you can, if you want to, go to the wonderful digitisation um, of the, all of the Board of Longitude material from Cambridge University Library that's in the Cambridge Digital Library. So all of the correspondence, minutes, um, some of the accompanying papers from the Royal Greenwich Observatory archives and so on, all of that um, is available there and well worth diving into. It's a really nice um, digitisation that has lots of kind of complete essays and little videos and, and things beyond just the um, very useful historical material itself. So the people who were there in the room um, were political people, they were naval people, they were scientific people. We can imagine Speaker of the House of Commons today, John Burko, sitting down with people like Paul Nurse, President of the Royal Society, um, the professors from Oxford and Cambridge, and a bunch of admirals as well. Why were they there? Well, it's all about this act, which you probably have heard of, the Longitude Act of 1714, which had its first centenary last year. So the commissioners of longitude have been appointed um, by this act in 1714. Um, at that point, they'd, offered, they'd um, appointed 23 commissioners, um, some by name, some by position. Usually only seven or eight of them actually got together and met, um, mostly the professors, the president of the Royal Society, first one of the Admiralty maybe. Um, those were the kind of key important ones. You can see the number who were there in that sort of 1765 meeting that it was a more important one than usual. But the Longitude Act was passed um, to set up a series of rewards um, for people to be encouraged, as they said, a due and sufficient encouragement to any such person or persons as shall discover a proper method of finding the said longitude. <coughs> rewards could be paid for promising ideas. They could be paid, what was, um, the term was, to make trial of such ideas. So to get an idea ready to a point where maybe it could be tested. The very largest rewards that were on offer depended on one official trial um, that would be um, over a significant ocean um, and would be going, they said in the act, from Great Britain to any such port in the West Indies as those commissioners shall choose without losing their longitude. There was then a series of rewards depending on how um, accurately um, they managed to find or keep their longitude um, during that trial. Um, if it was within a degree of longitude, which is equivalent to about 60 geographical miles, then there was a £10,000 um, prize, or reward rather, uh, up for grabs. If it was two-thirds of a degree, £15,000. 
if it was half a degree of reward, could be £20,000, which, um, as I say, is a very large amount of money um, at that period. The other thing that was in the Act, and that's something that um, caused a lot of debate later on, was they said that, that the method had to have this trial, but also that it should be tried and found practicable and useful at sea. This ended up being a clause that had wiggle room and was there that could be interpreted in different ways by different people depending on their interests. So, for the 1765 meeting, there had been this kind of trial to the West Indies. So the question was, was that £20,000 reward, the stock reward, about to be dispensed? If so, did that mean the job of the commissioners of longitude set up in 1714 now, decades later, was their job done? Was that it? Would the board end? It didn't. It went on until 1828. So it clearly felt there was still work to be done, um, significantly beyond that date. Um, and indeed, its work didn't go away. It got dissolved and um, the work was uh, reallocated elsewhere within the Admiralty. So it wasn't the moment that you could just say, job done, and we'll find out why. Firstly, in case anyone does know, and I'm sure everyone in this room does, but um, just for my very quick recap um, of what is longitude and why is it a problem. Um, so longitude and latitude are obviously the lines um, by which we divide up the Earth so that we can, the coordinates so that we can place someone on the surface of the Earth. Um, longitude lines are the ones that run pole to pole, but what they're measuring is your um, traveling east-west around the Earth. Um, latitude um, goes the other way. The latitude lines are parallel to the equator and measure how far north or south you are of that point. Latitude has a fixed point because of the equator, something that doesn't shift, and its relationship with um, the sun and the stars um, doesn't change um, in, in as much as it does for, for longitude. So there is something there against pe which people can uh, measure themselves, meaning that if you take observations of how high the sun is in the sky at midday, as long as you know the time of year, um, then you will know how far north or south you are. So obviously we'd expect the sun to be very high in the sky if you're right at the equator. It will be much lower in the sky um, if you're much further north or south. So that was relatively easy to do um, with observations. Longitude was a much trickier problem because the Earth um, is in motion. It is constantly rotating and there is no fixed resting point in the same kind of way. There's no uh, equivalent to the equator for longitude. What was known is that um, difference in time is equivalent to difference in longitude. Um, so the relationship between time and longitude was established in ancient times. That was known. That was not um, something that had to be discovered in the 18th century. But the problem was how do you find out the time in two places at once? You can find local time where you are by making observations of the sun or the stars. What you can't do is make an observation where you are to find out what the time is on the other side of the world to work out that you are X number of hours and therefore X number of um, degrees away from that point. Um, so the problem that they were grappling with in the 18th century was how to find that reference time. Very obvious if you have a timekeeper with you that can keep accurate time, you set it in one place, you travel overseas and you can check that timekeeper and it's not gone wrong, its rate has been entirely predictable, then you can use that to compare with your local reference time. Trouble is, very accurate clocks, well for a long time they didn't exist, and then um, the very accurate clocks that they had um, in the 17th century, for example, were pendulum clocks, and pendulums really do not work very well while you're at sea of the effects of gravity. And a whole host of other problems as well. The fact that temperature is changing as you're traveling, humidity is changing, the works of your clock get bunged up, um, how do you reset it if it's going wrong, or if it's going slow, anything like that. All of those problems existed in that kind of technology. We're a long way from having something that's as accurate as quartz watches um, that we have today, or digital ones indeed. So another possible answer was to find ways of using the skies um, as a timekeeper, not um, the sun and stars and the way that you could for latitude, but by um, looking at um, certain things like eclipses, um, eclipses of Jupiter's moon, so I'll talk about in a moment, um, or a little bit later, um, or the position of the moon as it crossed the sky against the background of the stars. These were all things that were looked at as ways of maybe being able to find longitude. So what those techniques were doing was finding um, a reference time through the stars as a result of having predictive tables produced elsewhere. So it provided a reference time for the point where an observatory was, for example. Um, so these were various ideas, but the main 
issue to know about is this one, but difference of time is the same as difference in longitude. These were tricky problems, but I think there was a sense um, in the early 18th century, among some, um, that a technical solution to these issues maybe was not that far off now. Consequences of not knowing your longitude. Um, obviously, it's a very risky business going to see. Um, it's sometimes suggested, or there's sometimes a sense when this story is told, that before good techniques for finding longitude while you're at sea um, were discovered, um, people were just kind of crashing into things all over the place. They were, you know, running into coastlines and um, wrecking themselves on rocks and, um, and so forth. And of course, that isn't quite true. There were ways of getting around, partly by sticking quite close to coastlines that you knew and understood and had gone past many times, um, perhaps by using the process of dead reckoning, which was a way of estimating where you were based on the direction you'd gone, how fast you were going, how long you'd been going for, and plotting that on the chart. And these things did help people get around. I mean, obviously, because this is a time where exploration, where trade is really beginning to take off. So people were navigating successfully. They were managing to trade. They were managing to bring goods back from um, China and um, America um, back to Europe. So it's not true that people were absolutely at a loss. Um, and it's also not true that once you do know where you are on the map, that you're then perfectly safe. Knowing exactly where you are is not going to help you at all if, for example, you don't know where the land is, which was a problem. Um, charts weren't necessarily great. They needed to be resurveyed. There were also rocks that people didn't know that would be there and would be a danger. If the weather is bad, then even if you know where you are, um, that's not going to help you very much if you're about to be um, wrecked or um, destroy your ship destroyed in the storm. So risks remained. Um, it was not going to be a panacea for everything. And certainly techniques existed um, that mariners were very, very skilled in um, that got them around. There's, um, in particular when this story is told, um, often um, mention of a very famous um, wreck um, off uh, the Isles of Scilly, uh, which was a large fleet of naval ships commanded by Sir Cloudsley Shovel, um, which was wrecked and destroyed um, Scilly in 1707. And it's often connected into the longitude story, saying that it was the sort of shock about this wreck that um, encouraged um, people to, to lobby for change and for the government to pass the 1714 Longitude Act, which is seven years later. The connection, when you look at it as a historian, is not actually really there. And we also know that that particular wreck was a problem of latitude, not longitude, as it happened. And there were all sorts of things that went into it, like not very good charts, not very good instruments, uh, problems with navigation, problems with clouds. Um, problems with the seas. So many, many things come together um, when things go wrong at sea. This map, though, I brought up because um, this is a story that does illustrate some of the problems of longitude, as well as quite a lot of other things that can go wrong, the many risks and problems that present themselves when you're at sea. So this map um, shows part of the circumnavigation of Commodore George Hansen, uh, which was done in 1740. Um, so well after the passing of the Longitude Act in 1714. They went out with um, eight ships. Um, Britain was then at war with Spain, um, and their aim was to sort of go around and capture or disrupt um, Spanish possessions um, in the Pacific. So they were sending out for Britain, going around um, Cape Horn, and that's what you can see here, the bottom of South America, um, and then going up, and the aim was to sort of capture Spanish ships and so on, um, and um, cause problems um, around Spanish possessions um, in the Americas on the Pacific side. And they did succeed in capturing um, a Spanish galleon, and Anson um, became very rich as a result of the galleon um, had a huge amount of um, silver and treasures in it. Um, but it was a really, really horrible voyage despite that. So only the Centurion, the flagship, um, this model here, I'll show you a bigger picture in a moment, only that one um, managed to make the whole voyage um, intact. And um, of the eight ships, um, there was about 1,900 men on board. And of those 1,900 men, only about 500 um, came home at all. Um, so a lot of people died on this voyage. And a lot of things um, were against them. Um, there were strong winds that delayed them even before they got as far as South America. These delays, the ships were very overburdened because they took on a lot of provisions because they were worried about how long it was taking them, but that kept the ships very low in the water. They were very overcrowded. Conditions were really, really horrible, and diseases like typhus and dysentery began spreading um, on the ships quite early on. Um, 
they made repairs and reprovisioned um, when they landed in South America, but managed to pick up malaria um, while they were there. The wrong type of provisions, or the wrong amount of provisions, or the wrong way of distributing them, or whatever it was, that ended up having um, scurvy becoming life amongst the um, crew as well. So we've got all of these horrible things going on at once. Very weakened crew, as you can imagine, people dying. Um, and then they had the battle round Cape Horn. Um, and there was, as often happens, really nasty weather, um, really dangerous sets of rocks um, around it, which weren't necessarily very well surveyed or very well known. So they battled around Cape Horn. The ships in the, the group ended up getting separated, um, and some of them were wrecked as well. So people dying all the time. In, um, so they began going around in March um, from right there. In about April, they guessed that they were far enough round, that they'd gone far enough west that it would be safe to turn north um, without hitting into the mainland. Um, they thought they were well west of Perestrego there, um, turned north, um, and they'd worked that out, of course, by dead reckoning, that's an estimating point. But what they didn't know was how strong the currents were that they were dealing with. So they thought they were somewhere like here, to turn north, Turned out they were somewhere like this, and so we've got two different paths shown on this map. Um, and suddenly found that they were about to crash into the mainland um, or into an island on, on the edge there. Um, Cape Noir, I think it's just where those lines um, go. And they suddenly found that they were much further east than they had realised and nearly ran aground. They managed to get out of this um, and headed on up um, for one of the rendezvous points that they were supposed to meet the other ships if they managed to successfully get around. Um, but it turned out that the existing charts had actually misplaced the island they were heading for by 200 miles, at least. Um, so they were actually at almost the right point, but then decided to head um, west, um, thinking that um, they must be um, needing to go in that direction to make landfall there. Actually, that was 180 degrees wrong. They should have gone east. So they had to turn around when they saw the mainland again. They'd gone too far, turned back themselves to get up to that island and eventually got there, but it took sort of nine extra days to do that um, maneuver where they'd gone 180 degrees wrong. And in that time, um, while the crew was so weakened and the seas was rife and there was a lack of provisions, another 70 to 80 lives were lost um, in that process. The adventure was far from over. Um, do read about it. They haven't even got to the battling of the Spanish and capturing the galleons yet. Um, but this was part of the voyage that really um, stuck with people when the account came afterwards. This model was one that um, Anderson actually had made for him, um, interestingly. Um, the ship, I suppose, did see him home. Many others died on it or on the accompanying ships, but it certainly made his name and fortune um, and did it get him home. I hope when he had the model, he also thought of those people who died on the voyage. He later became um, Lopez Order of the Admiralty, and therefore, as um, ex officio, he was a commissioner of longitude as well. So he did take an active part um, in the search for solutions to the kinds of problems um, that he had experienced um, on the Centurion. We had this very lovely model um, in the exhibition because it not only tells this great story of what happens when things go horribly wrong, um, but also it connects him very closely with the Board of Longitude um, and the search um, for longitude. Um, itself, because just a little bit earlier, and perhaps ironically, it had carried um, this timekeeper um, on a trial. So this is by John Harrison, um, who was a clock maker from Lincolnshire, um, and this is the first sea clock that he produced. So he was trying to find a clock that could deal with the conditions of being on board a ship, that could deal with that problem of gravity and the changes in temperature, um, the problems of lubrication on clocks getting sticky, all of these sorts of things. He first came down to discuss this with people in London um, in 1720, probably about 1727 or 8. Um, and he managed to impress them sufficiently with what he was doing. In particular, he came up with a very good idea for compensating for temperature, and that was to use um, in pendulums, this was for um, different metals that expanded at different rates um, and compensated for each other. So the idea of um, a gridiron pendulum um, that is a temperature compensation system um, came from Harrison, and that really got the interest of clockmakers, people like George Graham, who was probably the, the most um, important clockmaker in London at the time. But he went back home, um, despite this sort of level of interest, and went away and worked on his ideas um, in Barrow, North Lincolnshire, um, and came up with this. Um, which included this temperature compensation kind of technology. 
um, as well as these um, swinging pendulum weights that were supposed to kind of um, compensate for the movement of the ship, but nevertheless to produce the effect of an ordinary pendulum, which is seen as being the most um, accurate kind of clock that existed at the time. So it was that technology he was trying to make slightly smaller and make portable. So this clock, um, known now as H1, as in Harrison's first <coughs> clock, uh, was tried first on the River Humber um, in 1735. And it did quite well. Um, and again, he was getting a lot of interest. It came down to London. He brought it down to London shortly after that. And it was admired. It was set up in George Graham's uh, workshop, um, which was on the Strand. And people would come to visit it and say, you know, this is uh, amazing new technology. It was officially endorsed by the Royal Society as being something that was clearly interesting and performing exceptionally well. And it was, according to the First Order of the Admiralty at the time, approved by all the mathematicians in town. So at this point, it was taken on a slightly more rigorous trial than going on the Humber. And that's where it went on the Centurion. Um, and in this case, not all the way around Cape Horn or anything, but um, merely on a voyage to Lisbon. Actually, that voyage was bad enough. It was quite rough, um, the seas, and the results weren't all that great. But it performed much better on the way back um, on the ship called the Orford. Um, and Harrison managed to use the clock to predict longitude. Um, as they came back to Britain, they reached the Lizard Point. Um, and he managed to predict it better than the dead reckoning that the officers were performing. So he got quite a lot of accolades for that. People were, were very impressed by how, how it went. It was an auspicious start for him. Um, it was possible, maybe, that he would qualify for a reward under the Longitude Act. Um, what it needed to do now, of course, was go on a trial for the West Indies. The Admiralty, um, on the back of that Lisbon trial, ordered that the commissioners of Longitude meet. Um, and at this point, a long relationship begins between the um, board of Longitude, the commissioners of Longitude, and John Harrison. Essentially, Harrison causes the board of Longitude to form, in a way. They had been appointed as commissioners, but they never actually, as far as we know, met until they had something to meet and talk about, and that was Harrison's clock. Um, so the first meeting that we know about is from 1737. That's the first entry in their minutes um, in the university library. And what they did was meet and decide to give John Harrison some money. So one of these rewards that was an encouragement to help him make further trials. Um, and also, you'll see there's another clock on the end of H1 and H2. So he said, well, this is performing well, but I've got all these other ideas. I want to do this, this, and this. So he's like, I'm going to make a new design. And they're like, that's fine. Go ahead, do it. We'll find out. We'll try and try it out um, on the way to the West Indies at some point. So this could maybe go for the, the largest of the rewards. So all of these sums, this shows the long, long process and long relationship. You've got H2, quite quickly Harrison works, decides that that design just isn't going anywhere, and he moves to H3. Um, and you can see them lined up here from the exhibition. H3 was an immensely complicated um, site of um, innovation, really, in itself. This size, but just so full of parts and um, sort of novel technologies. And, Attempting now to kind of reproduce watch work, the, the smallest and um, precision of that kind of work in something still this sort of size. And you can see sums of money are coming to him regularly. And then he also then moves on to the idea of H4, which was actually a watch, so something much smaller and lighter, and therefore much less disrupted by the problems of motion um, on the ship. So a whole switch of ideas um, happened in the 1750s. So again, he's still working on H3, and um, the Board of Longitude really wants to try these out. They're giving, you know, quite considerable sums of money when you compare it to what you can buy for this sum of money in the 18th century. Um, and they're desperate for these things to be made ready and to be tried at sea. And Harrison never quite feels it's done. There's always one more problem, something else that needs to be changed, something that needs to be tinkered with. And he holds back and he holds back, um, at least until the 1760s. H2. Essentially, he discounts H1 as well, has sort of gone by the wayside. H3 has worked on for 19 years, but still never proves ready to be tried at sea, and it never does go to sea at all. So eventually, it's H4 um, that is a real focus, and the Board of Longitude's focus um, goes on to. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't appear here, but in um, these large sums of money come as a result of how um, promisingly um, 17, in 1761, H4 um, appears to be performing on a trial to Jamaica. So here we have the West Indies trial um, coming up. But there were some serious problems uh, that happened with the trial that meant they weren't ready to say this definitively was 
um, proof of the performance of H4. Um, so more money was given to, again, make the watch ready for trial. Um, Harrison getting very cross, he felt his watch had performed very well. They were like, well, we're not sure because of the way the trial has been run. Um, so they set it up to try it again. It's Barbados voyage, another West Indian place, in 1763. Before we come to that trial, which is um, a crucial one um, from 50 <laughs> years ago, um, given that we're in the Isaac Newton Institute, um, it's a good time to ask this question. Um, and this is in response to an essay that um, horologists wrote, which was, even Newton can be wrong. And of course, even Newton can be wrong. Um, but the um, question was, was he wrong in this? He said things like this, um, nothing but astronomy is sufficient for this purpose, that is longitude. I have told you oftener than once that it is not, that is longitude to be found by clockwork alone. And when the longitude at sea is once lost, it cannot be found again by any watch. So it has gone down in law that Newton was very against the idea of longitude being solved by timekeepers, by watches, by clocks. Um, this was advice that was coming from him to Parliament and to um, the Admiralty, because he was an advisor to government at the point that they decided whether or not to pass that 1714 Act. And then he was also, by dint of being president of the Royal Society, um, a commissioner of longitude. So he was within that context. He was someone that was being asked for advice. Ideas were being sent to him and he was being asked to make his judgment on them. And he didn't particularly want to get involved with adjudicating ideas that were based on timekeeping technology. Partly because he didn't necessarily have the technical skills in horology in the way that he did in mathematics. Um, but also because of this kind of point. It's not to be found by clockwork alone. So is he just dismissing clocks? Um, not, I think. So the idea that Newton might have been wrong on this um, is problematic. Um, for a start, he's saying, here, cannot be found again by any watch. And that's entirely true. If you're lost, if you have a clock that is not working, and you're in the middle of the sea and you don't know where you are, you can't look at the clock and hope it will tell you, or suddenly reset itself um, to tell you what your longitude is. Um, you need something else to get you to that point. And that something else was, of course, astronomy. Nothing but astronomy is sufficient for this purpose. So in Newton's view, clockwork may be subservient to astronomy, but without astronomy, the longitude is not to be found. So a clock can keep longitude, as long as it's working well, only astronomy can actually find it, um, and find it from first principles, as it were, rather than the possibility of a cumulative error building up, um, as could happen with a watch that is keeping time. So exact instruments for keeping of time can be useful only for keeping the longitude while you have it. If it wants to be lost, it cannot be found again by such instruments, which is, of course, true. And Newton's point, and the point that the Board of Longitude understood very well, was that these are complementary methods. They work particularly well um, if you're looking at them together. So while it seems from you know, all the effort and interest that was going into Harrison, from what we know, perhaps, about the later um, arrival of chronometers as part of um, very staple equipment uh, for use at sea, um, this point remains true. You need something against which to check clocks or to have them um, set and to make sure that they're maintaining good time. Um, so, this was one of the sources of trouble, was that the Board of Longitude understood very well that actually complementary methods, that things can work better in tandem sometimes than on their own, but the way that the original 1714 Act was written didn't necessarily give them that kind of room for maneuver. He was talking about a trial, a result, a reward, um, which was quite tricky when actually maybe what we're looking for is two methods to work together. So what were the astronomical solutions? Um, these are the two broad areas that um, Newton talked about back in 1714, and also that um, the Board of Longitude spent uh, most time, as well as looking at Harrison's work, um, investigating or you know, responding to ideas coming in from people with these sorts of ideas. Um, so one of them was looking at the eclipses of Jupiter's satellites, which happens quite regularly in the sky, and something that can be observed. Um, if you can produce tables that predict when they'll happen, you can then use them as like a little celestial timekeeper ticking away. They're quite regular. They were relatively easy to predict and um, produce those tables that would um, predict their motions. Um, trouble is, it's a very small thing to observe in the sky. If you were on a moving ship, particularly with a, a long telescope that would have been required in the 18th century to observe something that distant, um, it was an incredibly hard thing to do. You'd be 
you'd be moving out of your field of sight all the time. So very, very hard thing to do um, at sea. It did work, though, very well on land. So if you were steady and you could set up um, an observatory point, um, then you could use this method to fix your longitude, um, that is, work out the time at another place, actually very accurately. And it was used um, in particular in the charting of um, France in the 18th century. So Galileo, this is um, Galileo's manuscript um, showing the discovery of Jupiter's satellites in 1610. He had very quickly realized that as well as being a rather significant moment um, in terms of understanding the solar system, this was also a potential longitude solution. And he was very keen to sell this idea and to sell his telescopes precisely for the problem, uh, the question of solving the problem of longitude. So he was trying to interest people like the Venetian states or the Dutch people who were navigating or interested in this in giving him some money for this, for this work and this idea. The alternative, if Jupiter satellites are much too small and difficult to observe when you're on board a ship, was to look at the moon itself. Um, so the main idea associated with that at this time was what's called the lunar distance method. And this involved measuring the distance between uh, the moon and, and another star. The moon moves at a different rate across the background of the stars. Um, and if you had mapped the stars well enough, if you could understand the motions that the moon goes through um, over nights, over months, over years, well enough, then you could use it um, and compare with predicted tables to work out the time at that other location, that holy grail that people had. Um, and this is what, for example, the foundation of the Royal Observatory was supposed to do. It was supposed to map those motions well enough. This was one of the things that Newton's work was all about, was trying to solve the problem of the moon's motion, lunar theory. Um, his work obviously significantly pushed this on by understanding the theory of gravitation, but he really struggled with the free body problem, that is the different um, attraction um, uh, that was coming from the sun and the earth and the moon, and how much that disrupted what would otherwise be a nice um, regular orbit. It was a problem he wrestled with and wrestled with. He said, my head never aches but with the moon. And it eluded him, essentially, because it was such a tricky problem. But the thing behind it, the real driver for it, was thinking that this might be a way of solving longitude. Um, things were moving on from Newton, though, in the 18th century. New mathematical techniques um, in uh, the continent, um, more observations building in. All of this was creating an improved theory that was about to prove itself. And in addition, better observing instruments to get the development of the octant um, in the 1730s. So we've got something better than these cross stars um, that were available earlier. So, back to that Barbados trial um, that I was mentioning, the key trial perhaps, um, that happened in the 1760s. So, by this time, there wasn't just Harrison's H4 timekeeper put on trial, as had happened in 1761, but also things designed to help those two astronomical methods become practicable and useful at sea. So, the voyage was to go from Britain over to Barbados, I think it's here, can't quite read it, um, which is not really a difficult journey, not difficult in the way that deciding when to turn north when you're heading around to Cape Horn is. Um, it's really just about pointing your ship west and going with the current. Um, but it is sufficiently different um, in terms of longitude. So you've got something, you know, a good east-west space to measure in terms of the trial to see how well something has performed. Also a key area, obviously, in terms of British influence and British trade. So Harrison's H4 Sea Watch. Um, there's Harrison, there's H4. Um, they were sent out um, in March 1764 on board the Tartar. Went not with um, John Harrison, who was um, somewhat older by this stage, um, but with his son, William Harrison. But also on trial were the lunar theory, the lunar tables produced by Clyde de Mayer, who was an astronomer and surveyor from Hanover. Um, he'd been professor of astronomy at the um, University of Göttingen. And he had apparently done what Newton couldn't, which was to tame the moon sufficiently to make um, its tables useful to navigation, bringing together mathematics and theory and lots of observations to correct um, the theory, together produced um, new models <coughs> that were seeming to be promising enough. They'd been tried out by various people and shown to be allowing really quite accurate observations from which you could um, produce um, a reading of longitude. He'd been in correspondence with the Board of Longitude for some time, um, with the Astronomer Royal, James Bradley. Then also, um, his ideas were tried by Neville Maskelyne, astronomer who later became Astronomer Royal, 
um, all looking very promising, sadly for Meyer, who died in 1762 before they got to the point of being trial um, properly, but nevertheless, um, a man who's, I think, been too much forgotten. Something else on trial in the Barbados um, voyage was Sadly not this. We don't have a picture either of the man, Christopher Irwin, or of his um, idea, but it's similar to these ones. It was a marine chair, something that was meant to steady the observer enough to allow them to observe that very small thing of Jupiter's satellites up in the sky. Um, so like the Gimlich ideas, these are much later. Galileo had tried to come up with ideas. A little bit like this, something called the Celatoni. It was a helmet that would have a little telescope on it that was meant to sort of gimbal it to make it easier for, uh, for it to be observed. Sounds fairly horrible, I can imagine. Um, any of these would probably be quite unpleasant to look at. You're trying to observe something small while your body is moving about, um, which would probably not be very nice. Um, but these are later, these are from the 1820s and 10s, I think. So this idea carried on um, and on. People still trying to solve um, longitude through Jupiter satellites um, being observed at sea. Owen himself was um, clearly very good at publicity about getting heard, about getting backing, getting people to give good reports of um, his marine chair persuaded the Navy to trial it, got some flattering testimony about that which he published. All of this was enough to convince Board of Longitude to give him first £500 to make his ideas, you know, um, bring them up to speed a bit more, another £100 to get them ready for that trial in 1763 and 4. Um, so we don't have a picture of it. There is this mock-up that um, someone at the BBC produced, which maybe gives you an idea. I don't quite know why the Pope and Beale guys want to compare, but there you go. Um, possibly being on this. This is a sort of counterweight, so as the boat rocks, um, this weight moves around and then keeps the chair um, steady with the, uh, the horizon, as it were. So you can imagine how unpleasant that might be if you literally were moving about, seeing your horizon seems to be moving. Um, but that is kind of the idea of what's going on. Um, Irwin managed to get um, testimony from someone called Francis Drake, who doesn't otherwise appear to exist, so it may well have been Irwin himself saying that um, the excellency of the design and the masterliness of the execution were evident um, of this. So he went out and he travelled with the official observers of the Board of Longitude, one of which um, was Neville Maskelyne, um, also Charles Green, who was assistant at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Um, so they were meant to be the observers on the trial. They would carry out observations during the voyage using Owen's chair and also using Meyer's cables in order to make lunar distance observations. Um, Maskelyne had sort of proved himself to be a good mathematician. He'd gone through Trinity College, Cambridge. He'd done fairly well in the Tripos exam. Um, he had got to know people like James Bradley at Greenwich, and um, he had proved himself as a good observer and a good organiser um, by getting involved in the Transit of Venus expeditions and observations in 1761. And then on that voyage, he'd also shown that he could use Tobias Mayer's tables to good effect by <coughs> making lunar distance observations on his voyage. And he'd made great claims for the success. Um, of that, that method then. So he sets out, Green and Irwin, in September 1763 on the Princess Louisa to make these observations. The other very important job that Maskelyne and Green have <coughs> is to make observations once they reach Barbados to definitely work out where Barbados is. If you don't know where Barbados is, obviously there's not much point in taking your longitude technologies there and seeing how well they're keeping longitude. And that would be one of the problems with the Jamaica trial earlier. So they came home and then realised, actually, we don't quite know where Jamaica is. <laughs> so they're going to get it right this time. So, on the way to Barbados, Maskelyne clearly had experience of using Irwin's <laughs> astronomical technologies. He also was very familiar with timekeepers as an assistant to astronomy, both on ships, so small watches, and in observatories with um, long case clocks. But he certainly knew to the kind of work that Harrison is producing. More significantly, perhaps, in terms of thinking about people's interests and possible rivalry, is that he had published, after his um, Transit of Venus voyage, um, a book called British Mariner's Guide in 1763. And this um, kind of uh, reworked Mayer's tables in order to make them um, pre-computed, to make them much easier for doing this work of finding your longitude at sea. So this was a guide that was meant to be kind of easy for an ordinary mariner to follow, to set it down in steps, to make mathematics not too tricky and to allow them to use the lunar distance method um, at sea. So, not yet Astronomer Royal, he became that in 1765. Um, he obviously needed a way to make um, money, so selling tables like that, perhaps getting involved with training mariners, these were possible ways of making his career. So perhaps he had an interest in the lunar distance method 
being shown to work well. There isn't any evidence that he expected any kind of reward from the commissioners of longitude. Um, you should remember that on this trial it's Mayer's tables that are being tested, not the linear distance method or Maskelyne's way of using it um, that's on trial or possibly up for a reward. But certainly in um, more popular versions of um, this story, particularly Dove Serval's longitude, um, it's seen as being very suspicious that you have an astronomer with an interest in lunar distance method, uh, being someone who's essentially in charge of the trial of all three of these methods. And also, of course, the fact that by the time he returns and is in that meeting in the night of February 1765, he has become astronomer royal, somewhat unexpectedly after the incumbent died, um, and then was in a position, obviously, to make decisions about the outcome of the trial. So, Masculine arrives in Barbados, another lovely picture, um, and was very, very pleased with the results of the lunar observations that he made um, on his way. William Harrison comes with H4 a little bit later, and he reported that people there had told him that Mr. Maskelyne was a candidate for the premium for discovering longitude, and therefore they thought it was very odd that he should be sent to make observations to judge another scheme. Mr. Maskelyne having declared in a very public manner that he had found longitude himself. So here is this the skullduggery that you've been promised. Um, Maskelyne potentially in a position to fix results in favour of his preferred method, um, perhaps even hoping that he would um, earn a reward himself. And certainly quite a lot was made of it um, during their long negotiations between the Board of Longitude um, and the Harrisons um, as the century wore on. William Harrison um, in this report also claimed that Maskin was such a poor observer that he failed to produce adequate observations um, at Barbados himself. But I think the question remains, was, could Maskin have been up for a reward when it's Mayor's tables that are under trial, not him? Not at this stage, certainly. How reliable is William Harrison's testimony um, from what happened in Barbados? It's from what's called a journal, but it certainly wasn't a journal that was being kept um, at the time. It was, in fact, compiled decades later as part of trying to make a case in the later 18th century um, for the Harrisons to claim that they um, should have been given more money by the Board of Longitude. So it's only being erased after events, as are his objections to ask masculine as an observer, something that they knew, obviously, before they set out on the trial. And why were the Harrisons apparently perfectly happy to actually accept Maskelyne's longitude for Barbados, despite him apparently being such a bad observer? So I think the idea of a, a rivalry out in Barbados is in fact something that comes from a later period, when relations between the Harrisons and the Board of Longitude have become increasingly strained as they argued over how the trial results um, should be dealt with. So briefly, what were the results? Well, Owen's chair didn't do very well. The board basically just said, this is not going to go anywhere. Um, Maslin himself called it a mere ball and um, just, you know, didn't want to use it basically at all. Erwin was quite angry about that, but um, it was clear that this was not something that was going to go anywhere. The lunar distance method. Maskelyne said that the last observation um, that he took on the outward voyage was within half a degree of longitude, and the last one that he took on the homeward leg was within 11 miles, which is considered uh, more than that, so half a degree, uh, just to remind you, is 30 miles. Um, so that is considerably within um, what the Longitude Act has established for its £20,000 reward. Harrison's H4 did even better. So the um, Longitude found um, at Barbados, so comparing Maskelyne's observation, which they were obviously happy now to accept, um, because it gave them a very, very good result indeed, um, 8.5 miles um, of the truth or of the um, figure that Maskelyne had come up with. So, what do we do with this? Um, has H4 won, as it were, if it were a race? Um, it certainly got a better result, um, and the um, lunar distance were, were not often as good as 11 miles, it was often more within half a degree, which is the 30 miles. Um, so certainly H4 potentially um, seems like it could be more accurate. So should that have just be done and dusted, given the reward? Maskelyne, uh, sorry, Harrison certainly thought so. But, Really what they've got is two successful solutions and also indeed two, as I was trying to say, four complementary solutions working together. We're not just comparing um, that um, sort of 11 miles to um, 30 miles or whatever it was. Um, there are lots of other issues um, involved in these two um, different technologies that need to be taken into account. Above all, there's the fact that those two are best used together. The timekeeper is um, a simpler thing to use than the astronomical methods. 
Um, but only astronomy could check whether your timekeeper is working properly. Its cumulative error would be invisible unless you've got something to check it against. There's the fact that lunar distances can't be done, and every day of the month the moon isn't always visible, so having a timekeeper that can take you between those um, moments is certainly very useful. Um, so, all in all, the two work best together. Really, if you're bored of longitude, you want both. There's also the fact that there is one H4. That's all. One H4 that took Harrison quite a long time to produce quite a lot of money went into its production. So, observing instruments quite widely available. Tables, as Maslin had shown in the British Mariner's Guide, could be produced quite easily. And although it was unpleasant and kind of long-winded mathematics, it wasn't impossible. People could be trained to do it. So there is this sense that this could be rolled out, the lunar distance method could be rolled out more quickly than the time to make any more timekeepers. If you've only got one, that's not exactly going to help the whole Navy. There's also the fact that many people had already tried and showed lunar distances to work. And the principles behind it were quite well understood by mathematicians, generally speaking, invisible as far as mariners are going at this time. But nevertheless, there's a sense that it's more open access. It can be reproduced. Those tables can be made by other people. Um, whereas the, the secrets of H4 were absolutely locked inside it and inside Harrison's head. So the Board of Longitude was very, very keen to know that another H4 could ever be made. Could it ever be made that by anyone other than John Harrison? What would happen if he died tomorrow? Was that it? Was game over? Was this stuff relatively well available? So it made sense for the Board of Longitude to reward both systems and then also to continue to exist to back them up. So lunar distance method gets rewarded um, initially in this kind of way. Um, may I may have got more than three thousand pounds if he'd actually still been alive. This was money going to his widow. Um, and essentially in exchange for her handing over all his papers and tables. Um, they give a little bit of money to Euler um, because of the mathematical work that he'd done that fed into it. They also pay Halley's daughter um, for some of his papers, hoping that he'd make useful observations. And that he hadn't, but nevertheless, they spent the money. Um, he made some useful observations, but not the ones that knew because it happened to um, On the timekeeper side, £10,000 minus some of the money that Harrison already had um, went to Harrison once he revealed the principles of his watch. So the idea was, we know this works on this one voyage, but we want to know that it will work again. We want to know how it's made so that anyone else can make it. And they would not pay him money up to the full £20,000 reward unless it was proved that other people could make them too. So that was their condition. Harrison was spitting mad about it. But... The money, I think, in some ways is divvied up. They're kind of trying to reward both of them. It doesn't look very equal here, but if you then see that the Act of 1765 then held out continued rewards for both methods of five to ten thousand pounds, and also what they did was they set up ongoing payments to support the lunar distance method through the arrival of the uh, Nautical Almanac, which was published from 1767 onwards. So this is regular publication of tables has to be recalculated for every year in advance so that people can take them um, and to see. But nevertheless, this is being done by the Board of Longitude from 1767 onwards. Maskelin, as Astronomer Royal, takes on this work, although he's not actually paid any more for it. He does um, the sort of editorial work, as it were. He oversees the observations done at Greenwich that feed into it. He oversees the process of calculating the work. Um, the people who get paid for it are the calculators, the human computers who crunch the numbers um, and produce um, the final set of tables. Once Harrison had revealed his watch, in some ways the Board of Longitude is slightly not interested in him, what they were interested in was whether anyone else could make another watch. Larkin Kendall did, and they paid him to do that to make an exact replica um, of H4, known as K1, Kendall 1. But they were interested in what else Kendall could do. He had ideas about how to simplify the work, how to produce something um, that was cheaper, easier to fix, um, could be made more quickly. So there was a K2, and then this is K3 as well, which he made. So that was about £500, K2, £200, K1, £100, getting the price significantly down. And thereafter, they were interested in other people, makers like John Arnold and Thomas Earnshaw, who came up with further innovations that made the chronometer exist. So not the timekeepers, highly specific, individually crafted items like Harrison produced, but something that could be, <coughs> if not quite mass produced, at least made in plentiful supply and at a regular rate. So long-term support goes on after this. It is, as I was suggesting, a long process, 
um, before these technologies are going to be regularly and widely available to everyone who might want them and see in terms of cost, in terms of the technical development, in terms of commercializing these products, in terms of infrastructure so, to support them, and in terms of training to use them as well. Um, so there is slow take up perhaps um, for both technologies, but by the 19th century, um, they are certainly well circulating. Um, and somewhere like the Royal Observatory in Greenwich supports both methods. They, this is the centre through which the um, Nautical Almanac is produced to support the lunar distance method. And it's also the centre where timekeepers are trialled, where they're checked, where they're rated, where they work out the individual sort of interesting capacities of, of any individual timekeeper so that you know how it will behave when you take it to sea. So the Royal Observatory is um, the centre of sport the beginning under Maslin and then continuing under his successors as a place to um, underpin both of these methods. So, just to finish up, when was longitude found? Was it in the 1730s when Harrison trialled his H1 timekeeper with really quite good results? Was it perhaps in the 1750s when he first turned to the idea of using a watch type technology rather than the pendulum timekeepers? And also, of course, 1750s was then Tobias Mayer developed his lunar theory and took on that step one beyond that Newton managed. Was it in the 1760s when both those, tri those methods were trialled very successfully um, on the way to Barbados and back? Perhaps, rather, it was in the 1770s when they really put to use um, on certain very sort of high status of Newton's voyages. So I'm thinking James Cook making his circumnavigation. He used both of these technologies to great effect, both for navigation and for surveying. Perhaps we should think to the 1780s when those methods begin to be more widely available. Perhaps the captains of the East India Company who can afford to buy their own timekeepers. Perhaps we should leave it right until the 19th century when they're widely available, when there's enough chronometers that one ship can carry three and check them against each other without then having to resort to doing um, very regular observations in astronomy, where each vessel um, could um, have its three timekeepers, check them against each other, and then when you come to port, by this period, you'll find there's probably an observatory there against which you can then check them rather than having to make your own observations on land. So you can decide, um, but I hope that I've um, made an argument that 1765, 250 years ago, is a pretty good point in terms of turning point in terms of where we had been in 1714 or where they got to in the 19th century. And so there This is my final plug. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jupiter's moons are a fairly accurate, I'm afraid I can't, I mean, it's, if you're on land, you're going to get it to within much more than that, sort of half a degree, you know, or 11 miles or anything like that, much more accurate than that. If you're at sea, I'm thinking in time. Um, well, um, I don't, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Um, no, I can't, I, I don't know how to translate the, um, no, I'm not but, the chaotic system sort of, uh, over the long term. Um, I mean, I think what we're talking here is being practical. So it's about um, you know something that works well enough um, in terms of finding where you are. So you know, these are, we're not talking levels of precision um, of you know the kind of clocks we have today. And you know, we're nowhere near the point of understanding, for example, that the Earth itself is not a regular timekeeper. Um, so you know, there, there's kind of room for, for error that people um, accept. I mean, certainly using Jupiter's um, satellites for determining longitude on land was one of the main methods. I mean, this was being used um, in the 19th century to establish the exact difference in longitude between Greenwich and Paris observatories, for example, to try and get the absolute most accurate kind of measurement of the scale of the Earth and, and all of this sort of thing, or in the, the transit of Venus um, observations, for example, to work out exactly where they were. 
getting different parallax views, parallax views um, of the transit of Venus. So it was as good as they could get. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> did Euler get a reward because he helped solve the fiendish mathematics behind the three body problem? Um, Mayor? Yes, I'm afraid I don't know exactly um, what uh, the, uh, no, the no, equations were. But yes, no, it's because he, he fed it in um, okay. those equations and Mayer then <coughs> fed them into his, his lunar theory. Thank you again for bringing Euler back into this. <laughs> 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 um, any other questions? Yes, please. What, what was happening in the company? Uh, right, yes, um, I left that hanging. Um, I mean, again, we, we sort of become familiar with this story as a, as a very British one because we tend to know about Harrison and this is the sort of the thing that solves it. Um, all the same stuff is happening in France as well. There are um, people who are trialing timekeepers, um, similar to sort of period, certainly. Um, some of their ideas become ones that are, are brought into what becomes the chronometer. So, you know, Harrison's is far from being the finished article, but certainly his ideas influence them as well. So we've got exchange, and it's interestingly open, um, this, this, there's no sense, despite them being at war on and off in this period, no sense of trying to stop the information passing borders. Um, in terms of the astronomy, even more collaborative. Um, they are very much kind of sharing this information, and um, you, Masculine is inspired to produce his tables by Lacan's work. Um, he produced tables um, for the French Academy and so on, so um, it's, it's going both ways. Any, yes. For people who haven't seen a war, I wonder if they think that's a pocket watch. Yes, and if you see the, um, oh, get the portrait up. So, um, especially when you see this picture, uh, where it does look like he's holding a pocket watch, because actually he is, he's holding what's known as the Jeffrey's watch, which was the first bit of watch work he kind of experimented with, with another maker called Jeffries. Um, but this is significantly larger. Um, this. So it was called a sea watch, and it is using um, the principles of watchmaking, which are quite different to the principles of, um, use, uh, of making pendulum clocks. Um, but yes, it, it is not, and um, chronometers are not, um, sort of 19th, 20th century ones are not the same size as watches, pendulum watches. So thanks for highlighting that. One last thing. Newton's always right that his third comment on your clock stops your loss. Yeah. Now your GPS stops your loss. You still need to be able to navigate without GPS. Um, it, there, there is a bit of, there's a lot of worry about um, the vulnerability of GPS. I mean, it being a military technology that could be taken down, as it were, or disrupted. Um, so there's potential for people to be led badly astray if they're relying on their GPS too much and if, if the message is being scrambled, which could be done deliberately or blocked. Um, so there's quite a lot of interest in trying to revive some of these skills. So um, having been trained in something like the lunar distance method went on right up until sort of 1960s, and then it kind of drops out because you've got um, positioning systems, first on Earth and then in space, um, to rely on. But there's an interest in bringing back some of that and making sure the Nautical Almanac certainly is still published, making sure ships do have a sextant still somewhere on board, because it is the ultimate kind of backup system in a way that your GPS or your time keeper can't necessarily be. Um, so it certainly hasn't gone away and may even be coming back. We have one last question. Is there an account of Harrison's technology in your book? Um, yes, um, there, is, there is. I mean, it's not the, um, there, there is some in this. I mean, this is a narrative that's trying to tell the whole story, so there's not as much in that as there is. Um, for the really, really technical version, um, there is a catalogue of the chronometers um, at Greenwich being published by Jonathan Bex. Um, and his, um, he's also written about... Um, Harrison and Robert Gould, who um, kind of restored the clocks in the early 20th century. So he's, um, but these clocks have been more carefully measured and taken apart than any other scientific instrument I know on Earth. So they are very well known by the horologists. Not by me. I'm just an early story. <laughs> um, what I'm just going to just show up again, it's worth, you might, some of you might want to come and have a look at this afterwards. I'm sure Rebecca would be happy to see it. It's an absolutely beautiful book. Um, before we do a final thank you to Rebecca, I just want to remind you that there are, you see lots of people progressing um, up past the set. There's a lot of exciting events going on um, uh, in CMS today as well that you might want to go and um, check out. I'm not sure which ones are booked out already. Um, but let's thank once again Rebecca for a really fantastic. <laughs>
also read the book. Oh no, I just want to. You can ask it. Can we go up and ask you? Yeah. Yeah, just wait, just wait for somebody to come out.